Yes? Valentina, this is Arno. Uh, How was your walk last night? It was fine. Anything interesting happened? Oh, well, honey, I got a hundred thousand from an old man, and then a pimp slapped me around and took it away. And while I was in jail, I was raped by a dwarf. Is that enough? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you had some fun, you know. Hello and welcome to Comic Book Movie Oblivion, the podcast about feature films based on comic books and comic strips that people have stopped talking about. We're your hosts, Jordan and Kumar. That's me. And me. And this week we are talking about Baba Yaga from 1973, based on the Valentina comics by Guido Crepax, which started in 1965. Let's do a pause the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I, this is a non-pauser for me because once again it's one of those movies I didn't quite get. Right. Uh, in comics that I was like, I'm not quite sure what happened. So. Well, it's part of the yes. tone of the film yeah. and, and of the comic too. So yes, I would agree. No need to pause the podcast. This is a Jalo film. Yeah. You, you, you don't really need to know about the plot. I think in these kinds of movies. Yeah, that's yeah, that's true. Actually, you're often it, not you're not there for the plot. It's about the really. ambiance. Uh, yes. The, the color. Yeah. Uh, the surrealist tone. Yeah. That's very much very true in this case. Yeah. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about Crepax to start. So Guido Crepax was born in 1933, died in 2003, just after finishing his Frankenstein, I think. He did an adaptation of Frankenstein. He was into the old classic novels. Cool. He... You know who else did a, uh, an adaptation of Frankenstein? Junji Ito. Yes. And his art reminds me a little bit of Junji yeah. Ito's art. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So he was born into a very artistic Venetian family. All his family were artists. He studied architecture. Now, usually when you hear that and then you look at the person's comics, you're like, ah, that's why there's so much obsession about buildings. No, no. he hated architecture. <laughs> he studied it. He was like, right. this is not for me. He never draws buildings. He draws furniture like crazy. Yeah. Mad about furniture. Does not Furniture care about, you never see the buildings. Yes. Yeah, he's obsessed with those. Yeah. So he was a graphic artist for a while. He did like album covers and stuff. 1965, he started drawing comics professionally. And he started with this series about this uh, art critic <laughs> named Philippe Rembrandt. And uh, Philip or Philippe or Felipe, I don't know, he's Italian. He was also a part time superhero named Neutron. Neutron who had the power to paralyze people with his gaze. But yes. People and animals. And he can also speak to animals, I think. Right, okay. Although he never does it in the comics we read. No. It mentions it the, in the introduction that he could do that. Right. Now, he had a girlfriend, initially. Later they got married, had a kid. Her name was Valentina, and Valentina ended up taking over the strip. Much like Popeye. Yes, very much <laughs> like that. So, Valentina was modeled on the silent actress Louise Brooks, Basically, yes. her dark haircut, the bob, yes. I guess. And these creep packs in English was published very sporadically. Sometimes in heavy metal, you get a little short story or something like right. that in heavy metal magazine or somewhere like that where you could show breasts, etc. Because this stuff was very, it's very Italian. It's very erotic. <laughs> oh, yeah, very, Italian is a good word. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's full on. Yeah. Well, it's not pornographic. No, it's, the, it's the erotic. Erotic is the word erotic. for it. Yes. Yeah, there's yes. a lot of nudity. It's very, it's a lot of BDSM focused, it is, it is I would say. Yes, I agree as well. But it's, there's very much, there's things happening in it. It's certainly erotic and it's certainly an erotic comic. But I would say it's less an excuse to to look at bondage, say yes. for example, like Sweet Clint Gwendolyn, yeah, yeah. to compare and contrast. Yeah. That was very much, there was nothing happening except That's Gwendolyn right. getting tied <laughs> up right. every other page. That's right. Here, there is all kinds of creepy circumstances occurring. Yep. It's very, the introduction. There's a lot of dreams. Very, a lot of dreams. And dreamlike stuff happening in dream real life. life. Yes. There's, it's very, it's often, and I, I can, it must be deliberate, it's often very hard to tell whether Valentina yep. is asleep or awake. Yep. And there were certain sections where I was like, I don't know what's happening. And I read it twice. And I was like, what, what is this sequence? It, because, yes, well, um, as we'll get into, she's, she's under the, she's under a spell. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I found it very hard to find much information about Crepax online. So yeah, right. you did well there. All I managed to find, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all I managed to find really was, um, <laughs> for, I, I've got a couple, two factoids here. One, okay. Crepax was criticized for excessive eroticism in his adaptation of the story of, oh, oh. <laughs> which, just, which we just said that it wasn't particularly yeah anyway yeah, bizarre the other thing uh is that he also did a comic book adaptation of 
Emmanuel, the film. Oh! Which, if and you will recall, famously directed by Just Jacquin. Yeah, <laughs> Just Jacquin. <laughs> Just Jacquin, the director of <laughs> Gwendolyn in the Land of the... Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, so there's a, a connected arts there. <laughs> so 2016, finally, Fantagraphics started putting out these complete Craypax volumes, these big-ass fancy hardcovers. You're doing the complete little library, but they're not in chronological order. They're thematically mm. organized. So volume three, which is where we got most of this stuff from, was the witches stuff. And oh, yeah. most of my information just comes from the back matter and front matter of those that volume. And there's those volumes have a lot of like that kind of stuff. Oddly, they do not publish the years that the stories... Despite all the other material in there, they don't tell you what year that story was that first published. That is a published, funny omission. Hmm. Which is annoying, because I really want to know what the gap was between the publication of the Baba Yaga stories of Valentina and the movie coming out in 73. Oh, good point. Because I don't know how much... I have a feeling it was, like, not much, but I don't remember where I got that impression from. So the other important thing I want to mention here is that Valentina ages. So she's, like, 20 years old in the first story in 1965. Crepex's last... Valentina's story came out in 1996. She was 58 years old. Amazing. Yeah. It's like Prince Valiant. Yeah. <laughs> she got older. She got married. She had a, a kid, Mattia. Um, oh, with yeah. The well, she has the, the kid in, in, the, in the volumes we read. Yeah. Yeah. So, and she has a, you know, she has a job. So she's kind of an she's interesting character. Fashion photographer. Yeah. Fashion photographer is what they call her. She might, you think she's an, uh, an erotic? Based on the, in the movie, it's like she's, She's shooting for Ooh La La magazine or yeah. something. It's like, what fashion magazine, what Elle or Vogue needs these pictures? Yeah, that's a good point. In the, in the film, it, it goes out of its way to establish that she's a, a competent photographer in all manner of photographic endeavors. It mentions that she does news, she does yes. photo shoots, she does all these other stuff. But the only thing we ever see her doing is fairly risque stuff. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Now we should. We're gonna try to describe the plot of. Actually, the, I think the bare bones plot is actually. It makes sense. I think it's quite straightforward plot, and simple. I think the plot is fine. Yeah, it's it's the presentation. It's how it, how you, we get from A to B. And it's not the even the part. fact that it's like you're going in and out of dream sequences. The layouts. I really was thinking about how do comics work as I was reading these Crepex stories. So I was like, is the unit the panel or the page or this block or how am I supposed mm. to be looking at this and it's quite different from the kind of comics we usually read oh yeah it's very avant-garde kind of stuff oh, God, a good word. Um, but I think maybe it was just evolved independently of like American comics but at the same time all those European guys you'd hear them talk about how they read American comics or watched American movies so they had these ideas of genre like Neutron like her husband was started out as this kind of superhero type of character that could paralyze things with his gaze yeah so that's kind of all rolled in there as well but his panel layers are just like the panels are just chopped up in crazy tiny ways sometimes he's got arrows that point and tell you which panel to read next. Mm -hmm. Are you supposed to go down or to the left? But there's one panel on one page I noted where the arrow goes in two directions. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that too. At once. It's like pointing in two directions. So you really don't know which way you're supposed to be reading this thing. Anyway, we start out with a dream. Oh, no. It's... Okay, we start out with a dream of a beach. And you can correct me any at any point. It's a dream of a beach and seagulls and eggs and Valentina is pregnant in this Yes. Dream. Or she becomes pregnant. From You turn the page and she's pregnant. She's pregnant. On the first page, she's not. Right. And you turn the page, and the very next panel, she's pregnant. Right. But she's put eggs on... Like, she's buried eggs on the beach like a seagull would, I guess? Yeah. I don't know if seagulls or do that. Or a turtle, perhaps? A sea turtle? Yeah. So she wakes up. She's in a cinema. And she wants to stay at the end, even though she's there with Philippe, her husband, even though they've already seen it a bunch of times. And then they finally leave, and... On their way out, she's almost hit by a car, but Philippe kind of yells to her to, like, look out or whatever, and she jumps out of the way. She's not killed by the car. No. And it turns out this car is driven by this old lady called Baba Yaga. I think she introduces herself as it. She does in the movie, certainly. I don't remember if she did in the comic, but anyway. Now, it's not just the layouts and the dreams. It's also the dialogue is very cryptic. Yes. So she said, I had to run... Because I knew I could kill a woman tonight, but something stopped what was agreed to. <laughs> yeah. So very mystical what does this mean? and mysterious. What is this? It took me, it was until my second reading that I realized, oh, she expected to kill Valentina mm. and failed because Philippe rescued her. Rescued her. Very possible. That's what I thought when I reread it as well. But I don't think it's super important. 
because it's meant no. to be, it's very it's very mysterious. I mean, spoilers, but yeah, this lady's in a big I mean, fur coat. We eventually stuff figure and... out that is it in the first two volumes or that Baba Yaga wants she wants Valentina. First of all, I think she's attracted to her, but also she wants to force Felipe to have children with her. Or is that in the later ones? No, well, she wants yeah. Baba Yaga wants a child. From she wants a Felipe. child by Felipe because because he's... there's a prophecy of some sort. Yes, and she it, it... and she's supposed to have a blind child, which is some of this has to do with previous Valentina stories about these beings called the Subterraneans, which they yeah. fought before, which are these blind things from They're kind of like Morlocks. Yeah. Except tall and spindly instead of squat and hairy. Right. And, yeah, they're and blind. blind. And uh, it turns out Baba Yaga herself is one of these subterraneans, yes. although sighted for some reason. Yes. I mean, I... Oh, she's like a descendant, right. Philippe says and at the very end. As is Philippe, he's half subterranean. It's from then that right. he gets his paralyzing powers. Okay. Gotcha. Something stopped it was agreed to. She, the, Baba Yaga suddenly decides she's going to steal a garter clip from under Valentina's skirt. She yep. steals this thing. She kind of nibbles on it for yep. some reason. And then, uh, you know, Valentina and Philippe get out at their house. And then immediately we get we cut to a photo shoot. So this is Valentina show, shooting her model, Tony, a lady named Tony. But Tony, uh, I think at this shoot, suddenly falls... Was it in this shoot that she gets... Falls ill. I don't think so because okay, it's Bobby later. Yaga You're right. Hasn't had All access right. to her camera. Right. So Bobby Aga shows up. This is the next day. So Bobby Aga rings the doorbell. She shows up and she is looking at Valentina's camera. She calls it the paralyzing eye in the comic. Yeah. And then okay, and then we get the next shoot. And then Tony feels like she's suffocating for some reason. We don't know why. Uh, and uh, Bobby Aga, by the way, had also given back the garter clip. Yes. Tried to put it back on, and she's like, no, no, stop that. So Tony suffocates, and she can't modeling she feels sick she's like she can't model and valentina's like well what am i going to do now or she's kind of stuck so bobby Aga had invited her to come to her to her house her manor uh yes. and do some photo shoots there whatever yes. and valentina's kind of obsessing about this lady a little bit and she's like okay i'll go over there and i've got this jewelry i need to shoot she goes over there she finds bobby Aga lounging on this couch it's a wheelchair actually Oh, right. Okay. That's right. Says, like Victorian I'm, I'm, not, style. I'm not, yeah, a, a, a very old kind of wooden wheelchair. Right. Gotcha. It says, I'm, don't worry, I'm not paralyzed. I'm just lazy. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff that I couldn't, I didn't put together, even after two readings. <laughs> but her place is kind of a complete mess compared to Valentina's place, which is very clean and like modern. Bobby Agus' place is old. There's a, even a chair that's got like a hole in it. Yes. In the back of it and stuff. And there's a hole in the floor. Under a carpet. Under a carpet. Check hidden under a carpet. Hole. And there's a <laughs> there's a cupboard that's like it's like missing a back. Yeah. Um, that comes in in the later volumes. That it leads to a portal. Yes. Yeah, so well, she's very like, whoa. What's how can it be, Valentina? When she sees this hole at the back of the cupboard. This is a really kind of it's so decrepit that as you mentioned earlier, Krepax really loves to draw furniture. Yeah. And the, it is lovingly detailed just how disheveled and frightening and almost eldritch yeah. uh, Barbie Yaga's house is. Yeah. Yeah. It's very witch it's a witchy. It's a witchy. It's very witchy. Very witchy. Yeah. So Bobby Yaga sees that the necklace that Valentina's brought over and she's like fondling it. But things start to go crazy for Valentina. She goes around the house shooting stuff. She starts to have weird visions of stuff, but like she sees something moving, like these stains moving on the wall, yep. and then Bobby Yaga says it's just a magic lantern. Yep, there are but, animals about as well. Yes, in fact, she looks into a furnace. There's a pretty amazing sequence where she looks into a furnace and we get a shot out of the furnace and like the holes of the furnace are like superimposed over, her, over, eyes. Yeah. over her eyes. But in there she sees like a monkey having sex with seemingly a person. It isn't until we turn the page and we realize it's actually a doll <laughs> that this monkey has been humping in the furnace. And we th then there's this doll called Anna... Was it Annette? No, I almost said Annabelle. This is a different doll. <laughs> yeah, that is a different doll. Annette the doll. So this is a creepy doll that Bobby Aga says, Valentina, you have to take this home with you. And Valentina's like, okay, I'll give it to my son, Matias. She's like, no, 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 you must keep it for yourself. Yeah. She goes home. She has a dream of Annette as a kind of vampire that bites her neck. Then we get this the Touch of Evil sequence. She gets a call from Baba Yaga saying she has to watch Touch of Evil at a certain time, turn on your TV at this time. Then it, there's a sequence where some thugs seem to attack Philippe yeah. or but I don't know if that happened or not because he comes home and she's like what happened to you and he's like oh I, you won't believe what happened to me but we don't know if he was attacked by <laughs> thugs or not 
we just get it's about a, a half page kind of like series of panels where he's being assaulted and it never comes and up I again. was looking for clues like oh the rounded panel borders means it's a dream and if it's squared off it's no 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 none of that no, nothing so fixed that you could work out some it's not a mystery to solve you just no, you just have to right. live in it so she shoots Tony again this time Tony faints completely so Valentina calls her uh, model Rowena Oh, by the way, sometimes we see um, Bobby Aga using a Ouija board kind of thing. She's got some kind of scrying like device. Yeah. And she was using it in the house when Valentina was going around and started reeling, yeah. hallucinating stuff. Oh, another sequence, we forgot to mention the house. She finds this room full of S&M kind of gear, like this bed with whips and chains and all this stuff and a cage over the bed, and she photographs that. At some stage, she develops those pictures, and all that stuff is not in the photos. It was kind of like... In her mind, I guess, is what we're supposed to assume. She calls Ruin over. She has another, she's a male model, a black guy by the name of Owogwibi, I think. Owogwibi, I can't remember. It's A-W-O-G-I-U-B-I. Spelled differently in the movie, but he is in the movie, too. He is. But Rowena falls sick, too. Uh, she has a fainting spell or something like that. Valentina gets a phone call from Baba Yaga to get some scissors and cut up a photo of Philippe. Yes, cut out his eyes. Cut out his eyes. She can't do it. She's prevented. She's crawling around her house trying to crawl past and all sorts of crazy stuff. And Baba Yaga says, you must escape his violence. This is her message to Valentina over the phone. So the next shoot, Rowena comes back again, but this time the lights go out in the middle of the shoot. And when mm. she wakes up, she's been stabbed seemingly by the doll, yeah. which has moved. It has a little pin, which I guess is its hairpin. Pin. Yeah, or hot pin, yeah. And she develops the photos from that photo shoot, and they're photos from when it was dark, and it's like the doll so has the, come to life. And she the camera herself... can't have taken these pictures because the lights went out. That's right. And yet they've been taken, and what's more, they don't show the doll stabbing the model. It said it's a, a woman. A woman. And, her, Dr and herself... Valentina herself attacking Rowena, it seems like, like holding her down while she's being pinned and stuff like that. Right, it could be it, very confusing, but yes. Yeah. Some, some seriously, some weird mojos going on. Yeah. Then we get a sequence where Rowena seems to be dead in their house, and Baba Ega knocks on her, comes in, and they try to hide the body yeah. in various places. This scene, and it cuts away, you don't get a, a moment of a panel of Valentina awakening Oh, I had that. That was a weird dream where we tried to hide Reno's body. It just cuts to the next no, scene. That's right. So we don't. But know. actually, really, because there's a moment where they're like holding her on their laps, like wow, Bob. Because I mean, this is like a real dream that I've had bizarro dreams like this, yeah. where it's like you're trying to hide something and it's just right there. You can't do anything about it. Yes. It really affected me that bit. Mm. So the next day, she's out on the street and she passes a guy. I think she takes his picture and he falls over. Yes. And the crowd's like, oh, he's just a junkie. She has a dream that she's... Straight away, like the next page, that she's boxing... Boxing this guy. Boxing this guy. Now, I'm going to tell you something about these... Some of these dream sequences. This is the first one. When we... So I read the comic. I went to the movie. I watched the movie. And we got to the boxing scene. And I was like, this scene wasn't in the comic. <laughs> I was like, this is weird. And then I went back, it was there. Like, these things were, like, kind of going through me out. I just completely well, forgot. So, it's... it's And there were two scenes like that. It's it's such... It's so effective at creating an illusory, surreal world that you yourself yeah, are maybe. doubting... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ...what's real and what isn't. Yeah. The other one is... Okay, so we get... So now Rowena ends up dying, we learn yeah. later on. And then we get this dream sequence of Nazis on a beach like marching her and Val Valentina into the water to be executed. Yes. This I is another I'm not thing. I'm sure that they're Nazis in the comic. Right. They're certainly German because they're wearing the spiked Prussian helmet. The, right. The pickle halber. Yeah, right. Uh, I think they're definitely Nazis in the film because they have swastika armbands. Yeah. But I think in the comic they're just Baroque Prussian. Right. Okay, gotcha. Odd. I did wonder about that. Characters. Yeah. So this is another scene that when I read it in the comic, or so when I saw it in the movie, I was like, well, this weird scene wasn't in the comic. <laughs> it's there. It's nice. a very big, like, production, yeah. so to speak. Anyway, at this point, her and Philippe kind of figure out, well, maybe that the camera's cursed. So she calls her studio, and she's like, make sure that camera stays there. And her assistant at the studio is like, yeah, sure thing. But then we get these weird panels of, like, a bird stealing the camera. And then we get the next part two of the Bobby Yaga story. Yeah. So part two, it's kind of mixed in with the blue beard fairy tale, but basically Valentina goes over to Bobby Yaga's to get her camera back. Mm -hmm. Annette, the doll, turns into a human and she's tied up and whipped. And 
by an amazing apparatus that's powered by the bird. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's a little bit like that machine that the prophecy machine that Iago powers in the original Disney cartoon Aladdin. So you know yeah, Iago I, the parrot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pedals. It's like that, except it whips people. <laughs> yeah, this bird does lots of things around the house. Actually, it seems, including stealing that camera. But does very it does various well, tasks. It, may have it has a name the like an, an Anleto or Aretto or something like that. Anyway, so now we so Neutron comes over there. Baba Yaga demands he put some special glasses on, and I assumed that these glasses would stop his paralyzing power. That yeah. afterwards seemed to suggest that he had a clearer view of reality. And I read it again. I was like, I don't. I'm not sure. I don't remember. That. I don't I know remember if that's that correct. it negates his ability. Yeah. Because yeah, she's threatening him. Yeah. yeah. And she's got some. some she's got this Rube Goldberg machine yes. set up, so that he can't, you know, I guess, whip off the glasses and quickly paralyze her because the bird is positioned near a rope, which is tied to a cage, which is hanging from the ceiling, which has Valentina in it, and underneath the cage is. It look, it's some sort spike? of agricultural. Yeah, it looks it like, looks a like the, one of those. Uh, yeah, either a thresher or one of those things that stirs the earth yeah. for tilling. Mm. Anyway, if she falls on, it's bad news because it's very spiky. Yeah. He is able to get her out though. Yes, he kicks a cage which has a like a falcon in or a hawk. Or is it the? Which, is that when the cobra comes out? Or? Yeah, and then that that bird attacks the cobra. And then when the bird attacks the. He lets the cobra out of its cage. Yeah. And the bird... See, because uh, Neutron knows animals. So he, he lets the cobra out of its cage. The bird is distracted from its task. It can't resist attacking a cobra, its natural enemy. At that point, he brains it with a chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Baba Yaga's like, No, my familiar! Yeah. And uh, they push her down the hole in the middle of the floor. Yes. And then yeah, they're like... Talk about all of the... But, but, oh, yeah. then she starts speaking in gibberish, like a black tongue, and it's mm. the language of the Morlocks. And then Neutron Rembrandt says, Ah, yes, well, she's subterranean. Also, she's bald. The Morlocks yes, are all bald. that's right. <laughs> yeah, all through this, Valentina's been naked. I mean, it's worth pointing out that pretty much every page has and her models. some nudity in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, including Barbie Yaga herself, who's not entirely unattractive. Mm. She's got a kind of very it, it, frightening sexuality. Yeah. Uh, she's like a spider or yeah. a bird of prey. I'm just looking through it and I didn't even mention all the stuff where she... Bobby Aga sets up these dolls. Yes. She's There's some sympathetic magic going on. She, she's controlling... Annette seems to be the... Annette the doll seems to be the focus for Bobby Aga's control of... Valentina. Yes, that's why she needed wanted her to keep the doll and not give it to her yeah. kid or whatever. And then later when she's imprisoned her in a house, like Bluebeard... She's both Annette and Valentina are under Baba Yaga's control, and she yeah. makes them perform these kind of, I suppose, perverse acts. Yes, but she's doing it to make them hate Philippe. Yes, she right. has this kind of man-hating. The introduction thing. mentioned that the that Krebax might have been engaging with kind of like social trends at mm. the time. So uh, the kind of the impact of feminism on traditional Italian society. Yeah. As uh, there was a lot of this is I'm just quoting from the introduction. By there was a Barbara lot of Barbara Ostig or Ulig or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of migration from poorer areas of Italy in the post-war period to the kind of like richer, more cosmopolitan places in the north, like Milan, for work. And at the same time, you have the rise of kind of feminism and progressive social ideas, and there is a clash between those two forces. And it was very common for traditional elements of Italian society to label feminists as witches. Right. Strega. Right. And in fact, uh, so Baba Yaga's man-hating, the, uh, the introduction posits, is a dimension of, gotcha. of that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, part of that whole thing, like, he's like punishing them and like spanking them and all that kind of stuff. It's all... And the Baba Yaga's Bobby, Bobby always like, don't you see how he... Treat, he treats you as meat puppets or something. Yes. What do you say? Meat dolls? Meat dolls, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he, she seems to want to kill Philippe, or she wants Valentina to kill him, or no, wound him. She's she trying to blind to him with that voodoo with the uh, picture and the scissors and stuff. Yeah, that's right, because of his ability, the paralyzing ability, but it didn't work. Yeah, she seems... She's obsessed with... Val Valentina is not just a means to an end, it seems. Mm. She's obsessed with Valentina in some sense, and it's... Heavily implied that she has some kind of sexual interest in her. Yes. And even the immediately going for the garter clip is kind of... Oh, yeah. And she, as you said, you said nibbles, I which I think is putting it very chastely. Yeah. I think she was virtually filleting this, right. <laughs> right. this suspender clip. Right. And there's always... Um, they always 
especially you think Tony is like that lesbian like yeah she thinks that Bobby is some sort of lesbian that's coming on to uh, Valentina which she does you know eventually but ultimately she's using Valentina to get to Rembrandt yes because she wants him to father get a child on yeah her. and it has something to do with him preventing the the death of Valentina in the car accident somehow Possibly. some way that's connected to it like She's like, oh, I thought she misread the prophecy when he rescued her because he thought... I think she was trying to kill him because he had interrupted the prophecy, but now she realized that she's actually... She was supposed to meet him to have the baby, something like that. Sure, for sure. But ultimately, this is all... I mean, I'm usually very laser-focused on plot, but ultimately, this is by the by. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. This is very much... This is almost like a Jalo film in comic book form. Yes. Because it's very much about the aesthetic, about the sense... Oh yeah, he was the totally. Craypax was very influenced by films in general. Yeah, I believe it. Giallo it, stuff, especially, would have been. It, it high feels up there. often like it's going for a cinematic kind of framing. Yeah. At times, it, it and it it very much like it did feel reading it. I, I was thinking to myself, this feels like. Yeah. This feels like I'm I'm adapting it in reverse. This feels like I'm doing it in reverse. That I'm reading a, <laughs> a comic book adaptation of a film, specifically yes, a, a, right, an American, right. sorry, a, a, an Italian film of the late sixties, early seventies. And yet the layouts are so crazy. They're like they're really comic booky in the sense of this is not the layouts are not cinematic. There's the chopping of the panels are completely unpredictable. It's the ve it's the very opposite of having a. A screen that's one size that oh, you're looking at. Cinematic is not the... You're right. Cinematic's not the right word at all. But it just has this fractured... Yes. ...sensibility, which yeah, I... Yeah, and the threats. You know, the, that kind of threat you get in the giallo. It's usually with a knife. You know, glove yeah. holding a knife kind of thing. But it's it's kind of that kind of... That's kind of there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so let's go to the movie. Now, I want to mention also there was a TV series in 1989 that ran for 13 episodes. That's, that blows my mind. 30 minutes each. Seems short for a drama series. Um, but there was a, supposedly, a feature edit made for Cinemax, which is famously known as Skinemax. <laughs> I believe um, it. But I can't find the episodes online or the feature edit online. Um, Unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, so this was directed by Corrado Farina. Yes. Uh, he only did two feature films. This one and another one called They Have Changed Their Face. Was that l much later? No, earlier, actually. Okay. He did that one first. Okay. And it's a sort of modern take on Dracula, apparently. Right. Well, Dracula is a vampiric capitalist. So in the afterword of this volume, uh, they mentioned that he went away on vacation. He had done the production, post-production, went on vacation and came back and the producers had cut 30 minutes. Much. That's just like what happened with Prince Valiant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it's it's almost identical. Yeah. Which was the same, where the director went on holiday, Christmas holidays, and came back, and the producers had butchered the film. I actually managed. It was hard to find any information about this film mm. online. Uh, unusually difficult. But I did, through diligent googling, manage to find a 1999 interview with Farina for a fanzine. Okay. <laughs> that someone had preserved on a Corrado Farina fan site. Wow. It was like an old Alta Vista or. <laughs> GeoCities fan site right. that somehow survived the last, you know, 25 years. And uh, in this interview, they, the uh, interviewer asked him, I've heard a rumour that the producers cut out 20 minutes of footage from the film because of the sociological content. Is this true? And he says, Baba Yaga was in fact messed up by the producer who chopped about 20 minutes out of it, working directly on the original negative. Cool. Yeah. So, he, yeah, so that those cuts are lost. Mm. What made things worse is this massacre was done without even telling me. After my cut was finished and approved by the producer himself, and they did it without any hint or threat about their intentions. It's crazy because this movie is 88 minutes long. It's not even an hour and a half. Why do you need to cut for time at that length? I don't... I, uh, yeah. yeah, I just don't... You don't know what they're thinking. He said, goes on to say, utter and moronic contempt of any right to the author. After my reaction to this had a great echo in the newspapers they gave me back the ruined negatives so that I could fix it but it was physically impossible for some of the scenes mm -hmm. he ended up recutting the entire film it was still 20 minutes short yeah. in the end but he says that he does, doesn't really... He said if those 20 minutes had been restored, it wouldn't have made much different plot-wise. Well, obviously, because <laughs> there's not much of a plot. Uh, but he didn't think it was political censorship. 
He does go on to say, on the, on the other hand, that there was definite censorship, and watching the film, it's very clear where there was censorship, because the quality... The yeah. version that we watched was done for a DVD release fairly recently, although it was, I think it was before... It was before Farida died. Yeah. He, I think, helped with the cutting the film okay. for this DVD release that we watched. And you can see by the quality of the negative, because the quality drops enormously yeah. Yeah. When, it, when it goes to restored footage. And it's always nudity. Right. Uh, yeah, full, that's right. Full frontal nudity, specifically. Yeah, right. He says, The state censorship had us cutting a few seconds of full nudity, both of Carol Baker, who played Baba Yaga, and Isabella de Funes, who played Valentina. We were in that phase, quote, of our sexophobic culture when tits could be tolerated, but pubic hair was not. I didn't even notice that, but it's uh, it's absolutely right. Yeah, I did notice, especially the Carol Baker and scene, because she was an American actress that had mm. moved to Italy and was going into Jello films because she had some issue with Paramount or something yeah, like that right, with yeah. her contract. I read... Um, <clears throat> So I was like, oh, I was surprised that she was actually doing this. She did this she's whole an American th actress, but I, apparently she was doing it all the time. She did a whole she ton was, of them. She's yeah. like 10. Yeah. Yeah, right. Some of them are classics, apparently. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> she was in, um, she was in Giant? Yeah. That was her yeah. best film. Yeah. Okay, so we open with a naked Lakota girl in a graveyard. Hmm. This is our opening moment. I was like, what is this? And then, like, some... American soldiers come in and they're talking about taking their land and the Indians are fighting back. Yeah, and it's like Uncle Sam as well. It's and like, yeah. They're, they're, they're <laughs> Confederate soldiers, I think, as well. Or are they Union soldiers? They, they're wearing like those uniforms I don't think that I associate Civil War with times. Civil War. No, no, it's not Civil War times. Yeah. <laughs> but I, they're wearing uniforms that I associate with Civil War reenactment. Mm. So it's, it's a real anachronistic mishmash. Yeah. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, this is a dream. No. <laughs> well, is it though? Because what happened? So, you get all this stuff, all this talk about the, we've stolen our land. One of them almost rapes this Lakota girl. Yep. And then she cuts off his penis. Yep. Um, and then the cops show up, and then we cut to credits. Everybody flees. And I'm like, and then we get, when the movie starts, it's like something else. And I'm like, was that a dream or was that a reenactment that they actually ran from the cops? I don't know. It's so weird. It's, so it's like the touch of evil scene in the comic. I was like, was this a dream or wasn't it? It's never. It was never clear to me. She dreams about it later this, on. It's funny. Uh, quite a lot of the rest of this film, it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. But this just, I was like, I thought, ah, okay, I've read Baba Yo. I've read Crap Axe. I know what's going on here. This is one of those dream sequences. Right. But then the cops show up. Yeah. And they have to run as if they were... We don't see Valentina taking photos, so it's not... Yeah, it's that's like right. The, she's there. She's not the Lakota girl. It's like they're on a... like They're, they're like uni students on a lock or something. Yeah, that's what it felt like. It felt like university... Because... Well, we'll talk about later the on. There's a, the movie. Well... It's just... It I, I might. Because we'll talk about that. Good. All right. I, okay. I look forward to hearing that. Okay, opening credits... Done over comics pan Perfect. panels from the com from it. the Crapex comics. Really loved it. I'm always happy to see that. Really, yeah. He's like, I mean, Farina was like, there was no shame about comics here. He was like trying to do it. This oh, is yeah. a valiant effort. Oh yeah. So uh, I have more. If we're happy to hear yeah, some more from yeah. Farina himself, uh, he said the uh, the idea of doing a movie based on a comic book came from one of my teenage passions, obviously comics. As a critic and a viewer. I had always been disappointed by the transfer from comics to cinema, and it felt natural to try and do it myself. He says, however, I don't think I really succeeded. Mm. The reason why I chose Krepax's stories is I was literally fascinated by his work, which at the time were basically redesigning the whole map of worldwide cartooning. Mm. Bold statement. I'd already written an essay, a few articles, and a short documentary on Valentina, and Baba Yaga was but the climax of a love affair with one of the most fascinating paper heroines of comics history. Mm. That uh, documentary is called Freud e Fumetti. Oh, right. That's a, like a short documentary he made, right? Yes. Uh, uh, which is a special feature on the DVD. Which, okay. Uh, it is on YouTube, but okay. unfortunately with no subtitles. No subtitles. Gotcha. And Auto Translate is not quite good enough to figure right. out what the hell is going on. Yeah, right. Uh, also, he did another one called Fumettiphobia. Okay. About the kind of moral panic about, I assume, Fumetti Neri. Right. Black comics. Yeah. Uh, I would love to watch either or yeah. both of those <laughs> documentries. Yeah. yeah. But uh, unfortunately, I can link them on the on the Facebook page. But so if any Italian speakers want to watch it and yeah. let us know what yeah. it says. Um, so Valentina is has second billing. That actress is um, what's her name? Oh, uh, Isabella de Funes. Yes. Appar French, apparently. Okay, so, so she's this got, so this is like your uh, Jack Nicholson or you know your. 
you're, you're like in Superman, your hero's got second billing. The villain, uh, Carol Baker, has Carol Baker, top yeah. billing. In yes. This, as Bobby Aga. Um, and the credit is from the strip cartoon by Guido Crepax in English in this version. Yes, I think perhaps I noticed the ending credits are in Italian. Yes. I wonder if these opening credits are for the DVD. Yeah, or for the worldwide release uh, right, or sure. distribution release or something. Because I do know that there are version Italian. There's an Italian version. I think I've seen I've seen stills for it. Yeah. So we get we open with. Um, it's actually not Philippe in this movie. There's no Philippe or Mattia the son in this movie. She's no. got a boyfriend, which is a character from other Valentina stories, yes. a film director. Uh, but we'll get to him. So I, th I don't think it's him. It's some other character. It's reading political newspapers at the start. There's a lot of talk about politics in terms of the artist's relationship to politics. Anytime yeah. there's a person, there's a scene of people walking from one place to another... They're talking about selling out or mm. what's the artist's responsibility in terms of getting viewers or getting a message out there. Should they try to get to the most number of people or the least? Yeah, this is very typical uh, Italian intelligentsia kind of carry on. Both yeah. Farina and Krepax were uh, left wing kind of. Yeah, there's a little bit of this in, in the comic. Um, there's a scene where Philippe is reading a newspaper about an ecological disaster where they found a bunch of garbage in a, in a sea. And that's actually during the dream sequence where they tried to hide Rowena's body. But um, So there's a little bit of that. Hmm. There's a bizarre line here where even Snoopy himself is a subversive. And I'm like, this is an interesting <laughs> view of cartooning. Well, they, they do. They're also, the other thing that they're talking about a lot, along with politics is car comics and cartoons. Yes. yes. This is wearing its origins Oh yeah, there's proudly. one character. One character is a cartoonist yeah. in the this movie. I mean, yeah, that's right. And they're talking about the merits of their different art forms, photography and film and cartooning, comic drawing. Yeah. It, this is a film that's wearing its origins on its sleeve proudly. Because yeah. we, people are often reading comics, talking yes. about comics. Yes. Hey, Using I was, I was... comics as foreplay in one scene. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing that I was pleased to see, since, you know, I mean, even today, com well, not today, now a comic book adaptation like with Jitsu, you're announcing it. Yes. Please give us some of that sweet Marvel money. Yeah. But in the 70s, I can't imagine yeah. it would have been a point of pride. I don't even it. know what all the adaptations he's talking about are, other than Diabolic Batman. Probably he's talking about Diabolic. Modesty Blaze. Yeah, there were a few. I think it, it, Italy had a few more as well, actually. There was a bit of a wave of right. ones that you've never gotten English versions of. But anyway. So, oh yeah, they're talking about Godard, and she's like, I prefer Laurel and Hardy. It's very, you can see like, oh yeah, these are the movies I watched when I was a kid. Kind of all the stuff is in here. Um, so she, they, they leave uh, this party or something. Uh, she's going to go ride home with this uh, fellow who's, who's not Philippe Arno. Trevis, yes. Arno Trevis. Uh, so played by a guy called George Eastman. Yeah. Apparently played a lot of thugs and villains, and this is a rare oh, heroic role for him. Okay, interesting. Because he's quite tall, and I suppose in the right yeah lighting, he could be quite intimidating. He could do it both ways. He's a very handsome, dude. Mm. Um, so she sees a dog in the road, and she tries to save the dog from being. It's Hit not just in the road. It's inside a circle of candles. Oh, what did you even... <laughs> What's that? So this is very witchy, as you oh, said right. earlier. Yeah, yeah, There's right. Something is going on here. It's some kind of magic trap. Yeah, she decides, she decides to walk by home by herself. She doesn't want to ride with these guys. Because she's they're in a little sports car and she has to sit on Arno's lap. She specifically tells him, I don't feel like making love to you. Tonight. That's right, yeah. She's she very just walks specific. home. Yeah. yeah, I'm out of here. And he's like, okay. He gets back in the car. He's bummed out. Whatever. whatever. <laughs> she sees this dog. She tries to save the dog. She's hit, almost hit, um, by a car. Yeah. It's like a big black, you know, big black Rolls Royce type car. Yeah. Yeah. So this is much like in the comics. This mm. is Baba Yaga. Yes. Played by Carol Baker. Yes. Um, Who does all right, considering <clears throat> she's not really got the right... She's not old enough, for one thing. I think she's only in her yeah. Like 30s. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she's not an old witch like creature at all, really. No. It's very, very different from the way she's portrayed in the comic, as we said before. In the comic, she's almost skeletal. Right, yes. Like, a bit like very a spider. Yeah, yeah. Long, long fingers covered yeah. in rings. Yeah. Tall, angular. Yeah. Uh, Carol Baker, not so much. Yeah. She's quite, yeah. I think, voluptuous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she she drops off, she drops Valentina off at her house, which she knows where it is mystically. Da -da -da. Valentina's like, "How did you know where it is? It's not quite how it works in comic English." She's like, "But she takes the garter clip, she kisses it, yep, um, and she leaves Valentina. She goes away. Valentina has a dream that night of Nazis dropping her into a pit." 
Mm -hmm. It's not a dream that's in the comic, but it's like, okay, whatever, it's here. So, <laughs> she, yeah. next a day... A dream is a dream is a dream. Yeah. Next day, she has a photo shoot with Tony. Uh, and again, as I said, it doesn't look like a any sort of fashion magazine. She, <laughs> they've talked at this party that they're, this intellectual party they were at. They talked about how she's a famous photographer or whatever. Yes. Um, and it is, it's for, I think it's promoting something. Because Later, there definitely is a, sp a spray... Which is like a, it's supposed to tighten your skin or whatever, like a, a youth, I don't know what you'd call it. It's supposed to keep your skin healthy. But that's from the comic. It's like the same spray. Right. Um, but anyway, this photo shoot, so yeah, there's Ring at the Doorbell, as in the comic. But well, they're using sexy cowboys to sell something. Sexy cowboys, yes. Because that's Oh, what... this one, there's a lot of, uh, another reason I say it's more like ooh la la than Vogue or Elle, is there's a lot of like cultural stuff. It's very questionable. Like she's in a yes. sari. Uh, she's dressed as she's not dressed as a Lakota girl, but there's some. There was an oh, she's dressed in Egyptian, I think, or something. It's like oh, okay, this doesn't seem like fashion stuff. But any what? No, it could conceivably be. We're not the right people to ask. No, <laughs> it could conceivably be very chic for the time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, it could be. Yeah, Italy at the time, absolutely. Hmm. So the doorbell rings. It's Baba Yaga. She's got the garter clip. But she yeah. tries to put up, she tries she to reattach again, tries to put up her skirt. Put up her skirt. Put up She's her like, she says, I, I'm not wearing suspenders right now, yeah. please stop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She picks up her camera, as in the comic, and she this time she describes it as, in this translation, the eye immobilizes reality. Yes. It's supposed to paralyze us. I don't know if there's actually a difference in the Italian. Anyway. Um, so now she gets on the... F she leaves. She invites her to come to her house, as in the comic. Come to my house, take some pictures. Babaga leaves. She gets on. Valentina gets on the phone for something. She's got this very fancy plastic, clear plastic phone. There's a great moment here where she. I, maybe this she's phone talking is to really Arna. Kitsch. I don't. I don't think of this as very trendy at all. It's like a purse. It might phone. have been at the time. I'm sure it was at the time. Her I whole like... apartment is very chic. I yeah. would say all the oh, furnishings yeah. in there. It's very much but like. But she the hangs kind of up, thing. and you cut to the slum. This absolute slum. I thought it was a great kind of contrast yeah. there. And Arno is shooting a video, uh, some sort of film in which he needs to catch a rat. So he's like actually in this kind of bog water trying to catch this a rat. This water looks really disgusting. It looks really gross. I would not have gone anywhere near it. No. This guy's very method. George yeah. Eastwood, yeah. I, I respect you, man. You yeah. got in that disgusting water. Yeah, it was a shocking moment kind of. But he catches a rat. Um, she starts filming. She starts photography. Photographing them filming and their camera malfunctions. Yes. The video, the movie camera that's malfunctions. That's right. So no one dies in this bit. No one dies. But the camera like, oh, stops that's, working. That's weird. Lots of close-ups of cameras in the shot, which is very like the comic, actually, because you get lots of close-ups on Absolutely eyes and is. lenses. Yes. Um, so he talks about how he's um, he's also going to do a commercial for some washing powder or stuff. And she's like, aren't you selling out? He's like, well, you can play to a million people in a theater or 10,000 in lectures. All these kinds of discussions are happening mm -hmm. all the time yeah. in the background of this movie, which just tits in every scene. <laughs> Meanwhile, these guys are like, intellectuals are smoking. <laughs> You know, smoking their cigarettes and having it's so deep discussion. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, it really is. So finally, she's like, "Okay, you can come over." And he's like, "What? Really? It's actually kind of cool." I love the reaction on his face when he's like, "Oh, I can come over." Yeah. She's like, "Yeah, come over." She's ready now. They go over. He starts flipping through her comics. Yeah. It's a Krampax comic. Yeah. This is like um. We're going to see this again when we get to Smurfs, where they actually have some Smurfs comics. <laughs> it's a bizarre moment, but it's like a horny Krampax comic, because they're all horny comics. And she kind of is getting turned on, watching him reading this thing. And um, we get close up with all the panels, and then we get maybe one of the most interesting sex scenes I've seen in any movie. Because yeah. the sex scenes are, how can I describe it? It's... It, they're cut up into panels yep, on screen, so you get one. They're black and white, essentially stills, stills, black and white stills, overexposed. Yep. So that it looks like Krepax's art. Yes. When Krepax draws faces, you can go online and see just any of his drawings. It's very much he draws. There's a lot of white space, and you can see eyes, mouth, and nostrils, and the rest is just the suggestion of a face. Yeah. Uh, so they've, as Kamar says, we have rapid transition of kind of stills blanched out to look minimally detailed and filled with white space. It, it's literally like the comic. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, <laughs> it's it, as it, close it, as you could get to the comic it, without putting the comic panels yes. in. Yes. 
It's really something. It's very, yeah. it's really arresting. Yeah. It morphs on screen. They're like melting into these panels. They're actually drawn out as panel borders on screen. So you get multiple panels on screen at once with these actual photographs of the couple, stills of them with just like his hand on her waist or something like that. Yeah. Not like graphic stuff, just like that. It is. Very subtle I mean, kind of stuff. There are tits everywhere in this, but oh, yeah. I can say it's not really, it's not like porn. Yeah. It's not, I read one review that describes it as being stylish, not pervy. Right. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Which I think is a good kind yeah. of like short This scene very it. much so. And then when you actually go back into color and they're in bed together, it's still, sometimes it will flash into the black and white yeah. moments where you just got like a still, a black and white still on screen. Um, I haven't seen a screen cut up into panels. Oh, Hulk. Ang, Ang Lee's The Hulk does it. Yeah. That's the other place it's where really you can distracting through. in that. Yeah, because the panel, each one is moving, yeah. like, sec separately. That's, that's, not, um, well, that's not how comics work, you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> but this is really creative, and I've, I haven't seen anything like it in anything else. Yeah. Even in stuff like Diabolique or Sin City, it's, yeah. it's really experimental and avant-garde, yeah. and you can't see it anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, so now we get, much like in the comic, after the sex scene with the lover, in this case it's Erno, yes. uh, we get a photo shoot with Tony in which she, with the spray, the skin spray, and she collapses. Yeah. So now... I'd also like to say the studio itself looks like a comic book panel, because it's just yeah. a plain white background. That's right. With our characters in the foreground. Yeah. 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 So now we get, so Valentina's like, well, what am I going to do? Tony has collapsed. So she's like, okay, I'll go to Bobby Aga's house to do, she's, she's got to shoot this jewelry. It might be an interesting place to do it. So she goes over there. The house is very run down, dark and brown. It's a real contrast to the Valentina's colors. house, much as yeah. it is in the comic. It's yes. a completely different place. And much like in the comic, Bobby Aga starts fondling the necklaces the texture of them. She's using that Ouija board kind of thing yes. in here, that scrying method. There's a hole under the carpet, which Valentina oh finds. Yes. We don't go into the full... She, all drops, the, all oh, the, she, um, she drops a film canister. I almost didn't recognize yeah. what she was holding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time since yeah. I saw a film canister. She drops a film canister down the hole and there's no, there's no bottom. There's no bottom. It's a bottomless pit. Yeah, important to point that out for what happens later. Um, but the really psychedelic stuff doesn't seem to happen so much in this sequence. But she does see the doll, Annette, which in this version is dressed up in bondage gear. <laughs> Leather bondage gear. This Instead of bit, being just dressed like a Victorian this doll. This is a bit exploitative that it's wearing bondage gear. Because you know that when it turns into a woman, it's going to be a woman wearing <laughs> yeah, that bondage yeah, gear. Yeah. Sure enough, it is. Yeah. Um, oh, but Annette does have a moment where she decides she's going to masturbate. When she's in Bob Aga's house for, I don't. I think it's. Know why she I think did it's it? implied that it's. Oh, it might Bobby be the Ouija Aga's influence. The Ouija board because controls things. We keep cutting things. back yeah. to. Yeah, that's right. Um, Bobby Aga's fingers caressing those occult symbols. But this scene goes for the black and white stills as well. Mm. Occasionally, so we've it's we've established what this is, how it's working. Yes. Um. So she goes home. Valentina goes home. She develops the photos, and none of, as in the comic, none of the BDSM stuff is in there. Yes. And even the photo of Annette looks like a normal doll in the photo. Yes. Doesn't look like, so we didn't get that big bed with the cage and all the whips and stuff, but we've substituted it with Annette's outfit and yeah. some other things like that. Yeah. I, um, I imagine there were probably money constraints. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So they've just got sort of like a bed frame. Even to design the stuff, it's not, it's easy enough to draw stuff like that and come up with it. I don't know if it's actually workable in reality. All right, these bizarre sure. setups. Sure. This Rube Goldberg almost <laughs> Yeah, we weren't going to get yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so the next scene, we get these people on the street carrying placards that are like protesting, like almost anti-religion, like God is dead kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah they've got yeah, they're holding God is dead signs. So in the comic, she just walks past that guy in the street and maybe takes his picture and then he dies. Here we've actually got like a, there's a movement. There's like some sort of cultural yeah. thing happening. I've written down feminists and hippies and atheists. Yes, yes. So she takes a photo of one and he immediately has a seizure. Um, yeah. And then I guess dies. Yes. She has a dream of boxing him, knocks him out in one punch, as I recall. Yes, that's right. Uh, that's right. <laughs> now she's... She's freaking out about this, and she wants to. She's about to stab Annette with scissors, um, and then she gets a phone call. I think from Babiaga, which interrupts her from doing that. That also happens in the comic. In the comic, it's really. I keep. It's really. I keep using the word. It's really surreal in the comic because she tries to stab. In one panel, she's walking towards the doll with the scissors. In the next panel, with with no kind of like intervening imagery, the doll has become a woman. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
And then in the next panel, it's back to being a doll again. And there's no sense of build-up, mm. of transformation. Mm. It's just... Yeah. <laughs> and it really makes you... It must be what it's like to be delusional. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it really feel it's starting to break down the the barriers for us reading it. It always you can feel the barriers in Valentina's own consciousness breaking down. Mm. It, it's a very effective way of creating a surreal kind of atmosphere. Yeah, the film also tries to do this, probably not as effectively. But it's the one thing I noticed that the film does is uh, scene transitions will occasionally overlap one another. So a scene will end, and then as it transitions into the next scene, often a dream sequence, it will do quick cuts back and forth between the scene we just watched and the scene that's starting. Mm. I think just to create, to break up a yeah. sense of the, of transition, of the effective, pa of the passage of time. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of quick cuts in this movie. They happen a lot. Often uh, we'll get a close up of something and it'll cut away, but it'll mm. cut back to the close up, it'll cut away, it'll cut back to the mm. close up. And I, it's very much like some of those fractured panels that you were talking about yeah. earlier. That's where true. Where yeah. would... Yeah would just have, say, eight or ten... In the middle of the page, we have eight or ten panels. Ten panels in the <laughs> middle of the page, yeah. And it will be just two images repeated over and over. Mm. Or even sometimes just one, like a close-up of someone's lips. Yeah, yeah. And when the film's doing this, I'm like, I know exactly what you're doing, right. Farina. <laughs> you are trying to capture Crefax's kind of fragmented panel style. Yeah. So now we get uh, her next model, which is Romina in the movie, I think, not Rowena. Um, but... So, oh, so the the black guy comes over, the black, the male model. Yeah. He's a, she's like, where's Romina? And he's like, oh, she's at a student meeting about third world problems. <laughs> and Valentina's like, what's that going to do? That's not going to accomplish anything. Politics, They'll probably cause yeah. problems. Yeah. <laughs> this is a conversation they have before everybody gets naked, by the way. Yeah. Um, oh, half naked. Again, here are very, so in the comics, she said, when they're having the shoot, she's like, Valentina's telling him, you want to attack or you want to jump on her or something yeah. like that. That's right. Here she's like, I want you to forget you live with civilized people yeah. and be like those your ancestors who ate missionaries. Like, yeah, it's very, um, okay. Uh, this is touchy. It, um, it's, like, it's definitely, it's definitely racist. Oh yeah. And uh, he also recognizes the doll as malign. Oh, that's right. I feel it, and I feel we're we're meant to accept that because gotcha. he himself is okay. Only a step removed from voodoo mm. and. Gotcha. Jungle savage. I didn't put that together, but <laughs> you're right. Okay, so um, there's some something maybe worse coming up. Anyway. Oh, it's so much worse, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get to so that. So Rowena, we get it. So he leaves. The male model leaves. Rowena's still there. They're still shooting, but then the lights go out, as in the comic. And when the lights come up, she's been stabbed. Yep. The doll has moved. Yes. The camera has moved. All this kind of stuff has happened. Now we cut to Arno, who's shooting. We don't know what we've cut to. It's like a kind of action movie all of a sudden, where this. Um, Black it's the same, guys. Is it the same actor? Is it the same? No, no, it's not the it's okay. not the model. Some other guy. He's chasing somebody around with a gun, and then this other dude shows up with this and throws some powder at him, and he melts away. And we learn that this is the washing powder commercial that Erno has been shooting. But there's a line about how the washing powder gets rid of grease. Mm. And I was like, I don't like this. It's terrible. <laughs> Absolutely would not fly. It... Yeah, it's just awful. Yeah, so the, the, like, the other is they're missing advertising. Something in the like, in the, is there a translation oh, no, 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 here? No, this or is something? just racist. In fact, yeah. there was a, some hullabaloo a couple of years back about a Chinese commercial that was very similar, mm -hmm. where a black guy climbs into a washing machine and then comes out mm. Chinese. It's like, here's how effective our right. gotcha. washing powder is. And this, so this is, I think this is perfectly in keeping for kind of like the time. It's, yes. It's like unpleasant, yes. but essentially, so the man, cha they're running... As you say, it's a pursuit scene. Uh, the black guy is running away from a white man wearing a white suit. Yes. He has a bucket. It's full of the powder. He tosses it on him. He disintegrates and turns into a kind of like black silhouette on the ground. And then it says, this gets rid of grease. So the implication is, you know, like we're meant to associate black skin with... Yes. Dirt. Yes. Uh, they Presumably the authors thought it was clever, but it's just grotesque. I'll tell you, the thing is, in the comic and the movie... Valentine makes a specific point where she's modeling this black model with a white model and she says specifically like no no more racism or something. Like she point that word is used in both versions. Yeah. 
And this guy that comes in the movie is actually, when he showed up, I was like, oh, this is a cool dude. And if we just left out that line yeah. about civilized society and eating missionaries and this thing with the doll, yeah. it would have actually played... It would have been fine. It even, would have been futuristic. Even, I'm, I'm watching that line, because I knew, I think it is, I think there is something like that in the comic. I, I think she does say something like that. Imagine that you're not civilized oh, or something. Oh, right, okay. But... And, and I, um, I knew it was coming, and I'm like, I just, I just want to pretend maybe they're friends. Yeah. And she, she's just ribbing him to get him. She does seem very close to all her models. And she's just, this is just a bit of banter. Yeah. Like, but no, 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 no. This is just straight up racism. Yeah. So unfortunately, yeah. It's um, a, it's a shame. Okay, so he, she's trying to convince Arno that something supernatural is going on. He doesn't quite believe her at this stage. Uh, but they decide to go to the movies. When they, they go to see a German expressionist silent movie... It's the Golem. The Golem. Der Golem, yeah. That's right. And, of course, that's about a... It's a... It's a okay. If we strip out the Jewish stuff, it's about a wizard who controls a slave. A puppet. Right. Which, of course, is kind of what's going on with Baba yes. Yaga and Valentina. Yeah. Um, so, when they go home, she develops the pictures... And there were the pictures in the dark, and we see. I think what were, what did we see in the pictures in the movie version? Oh, uh, it's the the. Oh, the, the doll has come to life as a woman. A, a woman, She's a, woman a naked wearing, woman wearing the bondage bond leather stuff. gear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, then we get the phone call, and we learn that Romina is dead. She's yeah. died from her puncture wound, and now we get the dream about the beach, in which it's a little plays it a little different from the comic. This version, Valentina's marching. She's in uniform, and she's marching. It was Romina Valentina down. that was killed in the comic. Yeah. Here it's Rowena and Valentina is marching her to her death. And in fact in the comic it seemed like it was the not necessarily Romi Rowena but the doll? I'm not sure. Possibly. Hardly adds up. Incidentally <laughs> uh, the Nazi with the cat in this scene is the director. Karate ah Karate. okay. I heard he was in three roles or something like that. Oh wow. Well, yeah. I only noticed the one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so but then Annette the doll comes to life as a girl naked girl steals the camera and walks out. So we don't get the bird, no. all that complicated stuff. It's just, it actually this movie plays like a horror movie. Yeah. And it, more than a jello, it plays like a Chucky movie, like with the doll and stuff, <laughs> like, <laughs> and some of these sequences. It really did like they were trying to build horror type tension in a lot of this, these sequences. So Valentina goes to Babaaga's house to get back her camera. She's chained. She's t chained up and whipped. As in the comic by... But not by a bird apparatus this no, time. No, it's by, by, Annette. Again, Annette, by Annette. Annette is there whipping her in Annette the comic Annette is the stand-in for all the other craziness that we get in the yes. comic. Yes. But Annette does whip her in the comic. She's one of the other tortures. Anyway. So Arno comes home. She's not there. But he finds a note. Which with simply the says... The, with the address. She goes o He goes over there. Um, he bops Annette human Annette on the head and she turns back into a doll like with the a doll's broken head. doll a yeah. broken doll with the head popped off there's an altercation with Baba Yaga uh Baba Yaga falls into the pit mm -hmm. and then suddenly the neighbor shows up with cops <laughs> at the house and they're like this is an abandoned house nobody lives here and um one of the cops jumps into the hole to see what's down there Valentine's like no don't go down there but it's just like one floor down yeah so and it's not a bottomless there's place. nobody down there except Bob the doll's not down there except the doll's head is yeah so it's actually and then the dead. cop says come to the station tomorrow and they go yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> it's very <laughs> obvious that they're not going to go to the yeah <laughs> like, yeah yeah take that cops <laughs> yeah and um that's is that the last shot maybe some something like that i think that's pretty much yeah then it just rolls credits and we have more um, of Crepax's Krepas, art yeah. over, over the end credits. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think that about covers it. So is it trivia time? Do we have any trivia for this? I worked hard. Obscure movie. Uh, I did my very best to get what trivia I could. Okay. All right. So box office, I have no figures. Couldn't find any. Uh, budget, similarly, it's almost impossible to find any detail about that. I Going by the... Italian Wikipedia page, the initial budget from the first production company was 60 million lira. Okay. Which in modern US dollars would be less than a million. Okay. So not a big budget. Yeah. Uh, this was, okay. Uh, this was released as Kiss Me, Kill Me in the US. Also The Devil Witch? Yes. Okay. And Black Magic. Whoa, three. Okay, four yeah. titles, yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so those were it's some of its English language titles. Mm -hmm. Baba Yaga being the Italian title, I suppose. Mm. Uh, in Germany, it was released as Folterraten 
De Sinlichheit, which means the torture garden of sensuality. Oh. <laughs> two. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Foltergarten de Sinlichkeit 2. Uh, you might be wondering what was Foltergarten de Sinlichkeit 1. That was <laughs> another renamed Italian film by a guy called Joe D'Amato. Yeah, fam very big deal. Very Joe big deal yeah. called Emmanuel's Revenge. An unofficial sequel to Emmanuel. <laughs> I was about to say, usually it's the Italians that do unofficial sequels and number them two and three, like Zombie like, 2. Like Troll 2. <laughs> yeah, like Troll 2, yeah. They just yeah. randomly... So no, this time it was the Germans doing Marketing it. scam. Incidentally, okay. as you mentioned, Joe D'Amato is famous. He's famous for his collaborations with... George Joel Eastman. George Eastman, that's gotcha. correct. Most famously, a film called Anthropophagus, where George Eastman eats his own intestines. Whoa! <laughs> That sounds very Italian. <laughs> and George Eastman wrote that film. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Uh, Alright, so uh, production. Okay, so as I read earlier, the d director Farina was an admirer of Propex's work. Uh, and he wanted to have his uh, have a go at adapting comics to film. Yep. Uh, he wrote the script, as you pointed out, removing Philip Rembrandt and all of his troublesome associations with... And all the subterranean stuff. Yeah, his troublesome associations yeah. with superpowers and subterraneans and so on and so forth, replacing him with Arno Tremes. But why couldn't Arno's name have just been Philip Rembrandt? It's an odd... It might be. Interesting. Oh, it... but Arno is a filmmaker. I guess he wanted yeah. the parallels. That... Okay, yeah, it makes sense now that I have... Yeah, now to think about Rather it. Rather than just renaming him Philip Rembrandt. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. Since it's an adaptation and you and you, and you do like accuracy in your yeah. adaptations. <laughs> uh, he wanted to tone down the kind of like he, he wanted to tone down the erotic elements. Okay. And do and, and kind of amp up the uh, supernatural ones. Okay. So um, I suppose that's yeah, I guess I can kinda of see it. In this so if we Yeah, take I think that, that doll Annette coming to life and yeah. stuff is very oh, yeah, it's much... like you were saying, it's like we have horror tropes going yeah, on. Yeah. Rather than whatever's going on in the comic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean every time you get a close up of the doll's face it's like, oh <laughs> like we're not horror movie that's territory. Because you're just dolls. looking at the still doll's face. In the comic it works differently because that first time you see Annette's face, you think it's a person in the furnace. Yeah. yeah that's true. Um, okay, so he didn't get his first choice of actor for either Valentina, the character of Valentina, or the character of Baba Yaga. Okay. Uh, Anne Haywood, who's a British actress, was cast as Baba Yaga, but left when shooting began. Okay. Which is what led to Carol Baker being cast, apparently in haste. Oh. So they asked him in the interview, uh, quite often, uh, the cast of them, and uh, they asked, why did you choose Carol Baker to play the Baba Yaga character? And he replied, Quite often the cast of a movie is the result of accidents, of commercial compromises or compromises between director and producer. I would have liked to have cast Ingrid Thulin or Ornella Vanoni. I only know or Ornella Vanoni was a opera singer who actually looks quite a bit like Papa Yaga. Okay. Uh, eventually we hired Anne Haywood instead, but she backed out of the movie at the very last moment, proving herself quite unprofessional and rude. <laughs> Carol Baker had not a lot to share with Crepax's Baba Yaga, but she happened to be the best actress that was available at the moment. Luckily, her great professionalism was enough to make up for lack of the right look. Hmm. Uh, so we mentioned Diabolic earlier. Uh, Farina takes credit for Mario Bava being the director for Diabolic. Huh. They, yeah, you know, fun little aside, the interviewer asked him, there's something Mario Bava like in Baba Yaga. Is he one of your favorite directors? To which he replied, Mario Bava was actually one of my favorite directors, at least as far as horror movies go. So I guess he does consider it a horror movie, mm. Baba Yaga. I must admit, I like his early films Better, much better than such bigger vehicles as Diabolique, huh. which I am probably responsible for, since at the time I was writing comic book screenplays for the Gisani sisters, the creators of right. Diabolic, they asked me whom I would feel would be the best director to make the Diabolic movie they were starting to talk about, and I suggested Mario Bava. Wow, what a connection. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amazing. I have one more thing to say. Now, um, as with Diabolic, I contacted my Italian sister-in-law okay. to ask her if she had heard of Baba Yaga or Valentina. She said that she didn't know about the film, okay. but that Valentina is very well known, Oh yeah. even today. And she said specifically, it's well known for, she gave me a little quote, Tete e Cacetto, okay. which means boobs and bobs. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, these are, I mean, Crepex is a bit of a legend, uh, maybe, 
like I said, not very super well known in English because he w didn't get properly published until 2016. But even I think I encountered some of his stuff maybe in those old heavy metals or something once in a while. But he is considered a real innovator at the time. So I'm not surprised that he's still, your sister-in-law would still kind of be aware of her. And there was that TV series, so there must be some kind of pop culture. Oh yeah, he, he's Valentina and Kripax, like, oh yeah, they, she, she knew him. Yeah. Okay. All right, shall we do our votes? Yes. Okay, um, so the comic for me is a yay. Uh, I would be hesitant to give it a nay just because of his status. Uh, like I said, even after two reads, I'm not sure I got it, but I was really, as I said, very surprised for me. Like, I was drawn into the layouts and not knowing what, what I was looking at. Like, was it a dream or real? And sometimes, as I said, even the real stuff is very dreamlike. So, yeah, um... This is... It, it's also a yay for me. Yeah. Yeah, this is real art. I'm surprised. <laughs> I really thought you were going to come in here today and go on, like, what is this? Well, I when I was reading, I thought, this is the weirdest shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it's compelling. Yeah. The art is good. Yeah. Uh, consistent as well. I yeah. mean, we've done some... Some of our black... We've done some black and white comics over the past few months, and... One of the big, one of the my problems with the crow is not just that the art was, didn't look great, but also that it seemed to oscillate. That's right, because Eric was drawn very beautifully, and everyone else was kind of the very fast drawings. Where so much care went into the drawings of Eric Draven. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, whereas this, it, it has a definite, definite aesthetic, and I also really felt powerfully the sense of surrealism that yeah. he was trying to yeah. convey. Yeah with his panel design, with his abrupt uh, kind of changes from one image to another, the way you couldn't tell when Valentina was awake or asleep, yeah. the way sometimes little little elements from a dream would pop up in reality. Mm. And it's like, why is... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the film does that too, yeah. where um, Valentina is wearing the, the Prussian helmet when she's right. left the dream sequence, yeah, which right. it then turns out to be another dream sequence. Yeah. But it's like, what? Hang on, she was wearing the, you know, <laughs> the pickle halver in 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 on that beach, and now she's back in her apartment, but she's still wearing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I think it it's really really something. Even though, the, yeah. Even though, it, and I read a few more volumes than you, and it gets really weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they're all really weird. I think, but, but I think it's also yeah. yeah. It reminds me yeah. a little bit of uh, Drouet. Or oh yeah, or, absolutely. Or Mobius to, to yeah, a lesser extent. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's definitely. He was well definitely drawn. part of that generation of cartoon European cartoonists. Cool, yeah, cool. yeah, absolutely. Okay, the movie. Would you like to go first? Tricky one. I'm gonna say yay. I don't think it's completely successful, but it's interesting. And sometimes he really, when it works, it really works. Like the the sex scene and some of the other and it's yeah ah uh, so I have to say yay but I think there's a lot of maybe it's just it's it's giallo level I mean what if you like giallos you probably say yay to a lot of stuff that wasn't good so I guess maybe it's a bit like that uh, or horror movies in general like which I I mean I love a ton of horror movies that aren't good and I feel like this is kind of on that level there's there's enough in there that's good that I'm gonna say yay that's what that's what I'll put. It. That's how I'll put it. Yeah, that's persuasive. I wasn't sure. I, I I was leaning towards nay. Okay. Just because it's a bit. Even though I've been praising it. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever watch it again. Oh yeah, I think <laughs> I'm glad to know. No, I don't think I will either. But I I think I agree for it, especially for a Jalo film. Yeah. It's I'm surprised that it's not better known, and it's a bit upsetting that he never got to make any more films. I think he know. um. My understanding was he wanted his name taken off of this. <gasps> no kidding, when I never saw that. When the producers cut the 30 minutes, he was so angry. And then I don't think he, as you said, he only made, two, maybe he did make so, movies. Well, he, no, he didn't. But he, he had a very prolific career in uh, documentaries. Right. And in um, commercials. Right. He did, he was assistant director on two films before um, the, the face one. Okay. It was called, sorry. They have changed their they face. They changed their face. Uh, then, Dave Change Your Face was his first, was his directorial debut. Then he did Baba Yaga, so, and like he's he, when he was asked, he says the only reason why I did not do more films is that producers care a great deal about the financial result of my films, which I have to admit were disastrous. Right. But not at all about the quote artistic one. I was therefore forced to dedicate myself almost entirely to documentaries and TV programs. Yeah. Right. So there's um, yeah. So there's a gap of seven years after Baba Yaga till he does like some TV movies and shorts and stuff. I think he was really bummed about what happened so. with and, the cut. Uh, he definitely wanted to make more movies, 
you know, mm. the interviewer asked him, have you considered making movies again? He says, the only reason I never shot another feature film is the commercial flop of the first two made it impossible for me to get a third one financed. Right. I've pitched many movies all these years, all of which were rejected by producers with various motivations ranging from, uh, beginning with the word too, as in, oh. <laughs> as in too intellectual, too sophisticated, right. too difficult, and sometimes even too fantastic. And then he goes on to list a couple of the films that he pitched. Some of them sound really wild. <laughs> he was going to do an adaptation of a short story by Robert Sheckley called The Prize of Peril. Hmm. Robert Sheckley wrote Mind Swap. Yeah, yeah. Which is a great book, a uh, science fiction book. Uh, he was going to do one called A Tale of Sex and Comics, a sex comedy I wrote loosely based on The Beauties of the Night, a French film. Hmm. Uh, and he, the cl he came closest in about 19... 89 with a film called Un Posto al Buio, A Place in the Dark, based on a novel of mine which got published in 1994. Oh, well, it can't have been in the 80s then. It must have been hmm. in the late 90s. And it was supposed to be a modern... Oh, no, unless he published it yeah. after. Uh, it was supposed to be a modern time noir variation on LaRue's Phantom of the Opera. Huh. I would watch the hell out of that yeah. movie. <laughs> he says the producer was to be someone called Franco Cristaldi. In his opinion, the last great Italian producer, but it stopped at the last minute due to problems he had with a different film. I still have the letter where a saddened Cristaldi says he found himself unable to keep pursuing the project. In that letter, there's a sentence that I can make my own and I'll use it to close this chat. If only I could have all the flowers I did not pick. Mm. So are you coming down yay or nay on this? I'm coming down yay. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I got distracted by talking about <laughs> Farina's later career. Yeah. yeah, I'm coming down yay. Okay, adaptation. Another tricky one. Oh, uh, for this one, okay, I'll, I'll go first. Then. For me, okay. it's not. For me, it's not tricky. This okay. to me is a good adaptation. Okay. Uh, yeah. th I, I'm, this for me is a yay for adaptation. Yeah. So first of all, I mean, the comic itself almost felt like an adaptation in reverse. The reverse kind of adaptation yes. that you usually yes. talk about. So it, I felt like, yeah, that it, it, it felt like the, the aesthetic and sensibility of a. Of, a, of an Italian film it's, in this comic. Yeah, it's interesting because Crepax was a little bit indifferent to the adaptation himself. Yeah. And he felt that comics borrow from movies, but movies don't borrow from comics. This is at the time in wow. 73. Wow, oh, amazing. So he felt like his language, his panel layouts, his compositions were not going to make it into the movie anyway, I guess, was how he felt about it. That's that's really interesting. That That's cool. Um, that's, that's, he, I read, I found a page... Um, where someone was writing about the Jalo films that Carol Baker starred in. And he, the author of this article made the point that Jalo itself, he felt, drew on the sensibility of comics yeah. and comic artists I like Crepex. I don't think Crepex was right about Like, I, I do believe that comics yeah. started bar borrowing from... He says, a few... Yeah. Jalo drew inspiration for some sequences from Italian comic art, mimicking comic frames in photograph tableau, graphically depicting sound effects, vividly illustrated background environments, choppy zoetrope-inspired editing. Mm. There's plenty of that in this film. And using exaggerated colours for psychological effects, mm. like Suspiria. He goes on to say, what raises this film in particular above the more exploitative fare that it could have been is the care Farina took to duplicate Krepax's imagery. Mm. Several times, Farina cuts to high-contrast black-and-white photography, stills that virtually duplicate what Krepax created yeah. with his drawings. Yeah. Sometimes these images are extreme close-up of Isabella de Funes' eyes or mouth, the most cartoon-like parts of her yeah. face. Not just that, which every re reviewer mentions, these black and white stills. Not just that, but also some of the other things I mentioned, like the quick sequential cuts, which I think were made to look like yep. comic panels. The close-ups, not just close-ups of plot important things, but often a, a plate when, yeah. like just someone eating, but we don't see them eating. We don't see them in profile eating. We, instead, we see a close-up of just a plate mm. and a knife and fork yeah. coming in from the right and left yeah. of screen and cutting it up yeah. like you would do yeah. if you were illustrating it for a comic. Yeah. Uh, also, the plot is pretty close. That's true, too. Really? All of the did, plot they, points are hit. They took Even out the lines the, of dialogue are hit. Oh, I remembered what I wanted to say now in that big pause I did earlier. Uh, he's stripped out that Baba Yaga is a sim also a simpler character yes. in this. More comprehensive. Just a witch. Bobby She's a witch, the witch that fancies Valentine. Her motivation is her sexual interest. Yes, in we don't have Valentina. any of the prophecy stuff or anything like that. And it makes it a more dramatic and I, I think frankly interesting story without yeah. some of that wacky stuff. Yeah, but I think if just, you... She's almost like a Dracula herself, yes. right? Like Farina's earlier film. She's a malevolent old monster that's accustomed to plundering the bodies of younger 
mm. partners mm. and she gets what she wants through mesmerism and magic. Mm. Yeah, I think um, if you're a regular reader of Valentina comics and you knew about all the subterranean stuff, oh, you might you would be, be you'd be into that. Um, I'm going to give it a yay as well. Cool. But I do think if you like these comics and the kind of sensuality of the art style and the kind of willowiness, yet there's a kind of hard, hard edgedness word. about it as well, especially with the bondage stuff, you might be like, this doesn't look like what I love. I think it's a commercialized kind of version of it. But you've pointed out everything that he hits and he tried. Like, this guy was not a guy that was like, screw comics, I need to make a movie. He was like trying to find a way to make it work. And just for the effort, I'm going to give it a yay. But yes, I would warn any big Crepax fans out there who maybe like your sister-in-law, uh, <laughs> you might this movie might not be what you're expecting, but it does kind of play all the notes on a different instrument, I guess. Excellent, excellent. And my, I might finish my contribution with uh, a final line from Farina. Okay. Uh, he was asked, did Guido Crepax help with this film? And he said, I had and I have a great relationship with Guido and although today we do not meet as often as we used to, it was me who contacted him around the end of the 60s due to the fascination his stories had on. However, he had nothing to do with the creation of the film. He only sold the copyrights, he came to visit the set, and after the film was finished he wrote me a letter with his opinions, both positive and negative. Mm. And I must say, I almost totally agree with all he said. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so please like rate, review, subscribe. Please join our Patreon. It's at patreon.com slash comic book movie oblivion, all one word. Please join us on Facebook. Please send us an email. The email address is in the show notes mm -hmm. or you can DM us on Twitter or on Facebook anywhere you like. Next week and the week after we're going to be doing Dragon Ball because we've just lost Akira Toriyama. So we're going to do yes. the Taiwanese version of Dragon Ball from the 80s. The English dub is on YouTube. I believe it's on the Wu-Tang channel. That's the version we'll be watching. I don't know how they found it, but it's on there. It's pretty good quality. So we'll be watching that one the week after we'll do Dragon Ball Evolution. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs>